Um, Mr. Jack Houghton, thank you so much for joining me from the UK um, during this epidemic that we've got going or pandemic that we've got going on at the moment. Let's get to talking about betting psychology, which is something that you've written about um, for many articles on the Hub. Very popular, um, particularly with people that have been in the game a long time. It's a great way to sort of reset, reflect. Where did you start at, um, plowing into that? Was that your experience with VIP guys um, at Betfair UK and sort of seeing the discipline? Is that what sort of poked you into exploring betting psychology? Yeah, just that that idea really that with the people who make the game pay, uh, it wasn't that they were doing anything that I couldn't do. They didn't have some access to some magical knowledge, you know, that was secretly kept among a small group of people. Everything that you need to know to profit on betting is out there, out there on resources like the Hub from a practical, technical point of view. The key for me watching these guys became how do they manage themselves in order not to make the kind of mistakes that recreational punters make? You know, how do you incorporate the discipline that they have in, into your punting to make sure that you are profitable as well? At the time, I was also doing some work academically um, in the area of psychology, and, and these two worlds started to come together for me, uh, where I saw the work I was doing academically and how it could be applied to, to you, the day-to-day punting processes. And, and over the years, that's become a fascination for me. Yeah, right. So. Um... Were you just exploring that, uh, like you're obviously you're doing it academically, but were you reading other literature that you were coming across that was betting specific or is it more about a broader mindset of, of discipline and accountability and, and being less emotive, stuff like that? I think probably it was, I was reading very little stuff. I was reading quite a lot of stuff on betting from a technical point of view, you know, how you build ELO ratings, um, how you incorporate the Kelly criterion staking yeah. strategy. You know, I, was, I was reading a lot of that kind of stuff. But the betting side, or sorry, the psychology stuff I was reading was really from other realms. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I, I don't want to say this was the study and I had a light bulb moment, but, but you know, there's this, uh, there's this amazing study. I think it's one of my favorite psychology studies by, by uh, two academics called Darley and Batson. Uh, I think in early 70s, I think it was 1973, and it's, it's known as the Good Samaritan Study. And they go to a seminary, so a place where they're training people to be, uh, to be Catholic priests. And they get a bunch of trainee Catholic priests, and they say to them that they've got to go and give a lecture in a lecture hall to other students. And the subject of the lecture they've got to give is the Good Samaritan and how we need to be Good Samaritans in our, in our life. Um, what these trainee priests didn't know was that as they were running across to give their lecture, um, they were going to come across someone who'd, who'd kind of fallen down and needed help. And, you know, Darley and Batson hypothesized that obviously these trainee priests would all stop to help. And that if they were the priest that had been chosen to give the lecture on the Good Samaritan, they'd, they'd be doubly likely to help. <laughs> and the fascinating thing was, was that, that that just was not the case. The only thing that, that affected whether or not one of these trainee priests was going to help or not was how much time they had before the lecture. Um, if they were rushed and they were running late for their lecture, some of these guys were stepping over this guy who was lying on the floor in order to go and give a lecture on how you need to be a good Samaritan. Now, now, now for me, that was, a, as I say, it wasn't a light bulb moment because there were many, many studies which make us recognize we think we're these moralistic beings who behave in a certain way all the time and that we are constantly and consistently rational. And the reality is we are just not. And I think it was starting to understand this, this aspect of human psychology and then start to, to bring the two worlds together and start to say, well, we know, how can some of these lessons, how can I apply them to my punting? Um, in order to help myself become profitable. And I think no matter where you look in the world of psychology, you come across things that, that is applicable to punting. You know, it, um, you are much more likely to be convicted in court if it is the morning. 
you are much more likely to be convicted in court um, if your judge has had a good breakfast. You are much less likely to be convicted of a rape charge in court if your jury is predominantly female, which is really, really interesting. A doctor will come up with different diagnoses depending on the order in which symptoms are recounted to him or her by a, by a nurse. I mean, all of these things to me, that, that, you know, it's there in the, in the research. It, it's clear and consistent that, that as humans, we are consistently irrational. And understanding that and how you apply it to punting, I, I think for me, just became a fascination. Yeah, I know that I've done a few of these now and I know that so many customers take advantages of, of people with, you know, um, they, they can pick up stuff on the exchange from people behaving irrationally or, or following in money and getting at the bottom of the market and stuff. And there are a lot of people that profit off. Um, I think betting psychology is massive for um, particularly a certain type of punter. But um, what were you learning and what... What, um, what were you implementing straight away? Was it just recording your bets? Was it betting on less stuff? Was it meditating? Was it um, just being less reactive and emotive or being really controlled in your staking strategies? What were you implementing to start with that, that you could recommend to, to punters now um, just about having a bit more discipline and, and being less, um, uh, yeah, being less reactive, I suppose, and, yeah, I mean, I think all of those things you you talked about are, are good things to think about. I think probably the first step for any punter is this, and it is to recognise that there is nothing special about you. Um, and now, reading these psychology studies, one of the fascinating things about them is that you know, even now after all these years. I can be reading about the irrational behavior of my fellow humans. But in my head somewhere, there is a voice saying, yeah, but that's not me. I'm not <laughs> like that. Everybody yeah. else might. Yeah, but I, yeah. I wouldn't do that. You know, I wouldn't step over the guy who needed help. I'd stop and help him. Um, the reality is you, you just have to accept that we are riddled with these biases, this irrationality, this, this emotionality. And, yeah. and you just have to accept it and I think once you've accepted that that's quite a freeing and liberating sort of moment really the only way to overcome our irrationalities is by having processes um, you know we live in societies where governments recognize that we act irrationally and therefore what they do is they put rules in place whether that be laws or whether that be lower level regulations, to make us behave in a way that is in the interests, in our long term interests. Mm-hmm. You know, and whether that, whether that is they take some money out of our paycheck in order to put it, put it into a pension pot uh, because yeah. they know that we're not going to do that, that mm-hmm. willingly. Or, you know, in the current climate, the climate, they tell us, you know, how we need to behave in terms of our interactions with others to stop the spread of a, a virus. Um, you need to have the same approach to your punting. You need to put a process in place. Mm. Now, if people watching this want a really great book to read, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like it's a great book, but it is, is a fantastic um, book called The Checklist Manifesto uh, by, I think his name is Atul Gawand. Uh, he's a surgeon and he writes about different industries. Uh, he, he writes about being a surgeon. He writes about the construction industry. He writes about uh, he writes about being an airline pilot, and he talks about just how fallible and, and stupid really human beings are in all of these professions, and how the thing that overcomes it is a checklist. If you have a process to follow, have I done this? Have I done this? Have I done this? Have I done this? And you force yourself to follow that process, then guess what? we stop being so irrational because the process doesn't allow us to be irrational. And I think the first step for anyone in trying to understand and combat the the weaknesses in their psychology, which we all have, once you've got that acceptance of it, is to then think, okay, so what is the process I am going to put in place here? And there are multiple ways of doing this. and there are little kind of tricks you can you can perform on yourself to to try and make you better at sticking to it. But 
But actually just sitting down and explicitly writing out your process, I would say is a great place to start. You know, when you sit down to punt, what's your process? Yeah, uh, it depends what day of the week it is, I suppose. I'm, I'm already imagining, yeah, it being a Saturday morning, um, which is obviously the big horse race um, activity here. And, you know, when the markets move and when, when liquidity starts flushing on Betfair, when I can um, get some free time to myself, get away from my other responsibilities. Um, yeah, ha- yeah. I, I'm, my process on a Saturday is, is riddled with distraction um, and I can see how that, and I already recognise that, um, that that is impeding my results, but I've never addressed anything and put anything in place. So I would love to, you know, approach it the same way I would if it was quite a formal work day um yeah sitting down and and having a whole you know have as you say a checklist and a, a to-do list and running through things and doing it um with repetition i suppose having the same thing happen each week yeah and, uh, and you know and that that was a cruel question to ask but but what i hope people watching this at that moment did is say to themselves well look, you know what is my process and the reality is many of us won't have a clear process that we could articulate that that we go through. And I'm definitely not trying to sit here and and pretend that I am this kind of archetypal, uh, you know, winning punter that gets everything right. I absolutely don't. Um, But when I become unprofitable or when I behave in a way that's unprofitable, I, I probably should more accurately say, you can guarantee it's because I've stepped away from the process. Uh, yeah. You know, I have a clear written down process for what I do on a regular basis within tennis. I have a clear process written down as to how I begin to assess a cycling market. Um, you can guarantee that, that, that when my betting becomes less professional, it, it's when I step away from that process. It, it's where I, I don't have time. You know, you talked about your other responsibilities. I know we've both got young families. You know, it's where you're trying to, to fit something in into your busy day. It's yeah. where you just get a bet on because you've only got five minutes to get it done. Those are the things to really try and find in your punting and, and eliminate them. Yeah, I, I can see that definitely. Um, well, give us something else. What's another snackable, a snackable strategy I can implement to, to have uh, a better practice and better discipline? So I think having that process in place is is, is really important. And, I, and then I think little, little, what, little tips and tricks to make you stick to it. Um, I One of the first professional punters I visited uh, is a guy, he was a, a greyhound punter. He lived in, in an industrial part of the north of England. And I, I drove up one day, he, had a, he was having a few technical issues. And I was going up to try and help him with them. Um, and I, I went into his kind of punting room and he had a couple of screens there and he had a picture in the middle of his two uh, computer screens of his kids. Um, now, this was his job, and the punting was his job. And he said to me, I have that picture there. He says, and if I'm ever going to do anything, which I know is stupid, that picture is there to remind me that what I'm doing here is my job, and it's the thing that's going to put food on the table for my kids. And for him, that was a really kind of stark reminder, mm. you know, a visual reminder that you must stick to the process. You're doing this for a reason. And if you're going to deviate or you're just going to have a bet for a laugh or, oh, this looks interesting. I've just seen this market on, I don't know, the, the top temperature that we're going to have in Australia in the summer or whatever it is. I'll, I'll just go and have a few, a few dollars on that. That allowed him to not do that and to stick to the things he knew were worth doing. And, you know, I, I, I heartily recommend those those little those little tricks really um for a while i don't have it anymore i've replaced it with something else but i, I read a, a book about the new zealand rugby team and how their sports psychologists worked with them on this concept of redheads and blueheads and they talked about you know the redhead was this kind of irrational fiery violent physical emotional character that was kind of absorbed in the moment of what was happening and would make decisions that were really poor as a result of that. Whereas the blue head was this, this kind of calm, far-sighted individual that was able to take in the whole of the field of play and recognise what needed to be done when in a, in a much more rational, calm, emotionless state. Mm-hmm. And 
sports psychologist for the for the New Zealand All Blacks did a lot of work with players around, you know, what's a red head and what's a blue head. And then they started to get every single player to be able to identify in themselves moments where they were moving towards this redhead character and to ha- for them to then have these tricks where they could perhaps look at something in the stadium. I, I remember reading about one player who had a, who during certain phases of the game would always look up at a certain, I think it was a certain part of the stand or a certain light or something within the stand. And that would be the trigger, the, the key that for him would make him then start saying, no, I need to act more in this way and less in, less in this way. And for a while there, I, I had little pictures of a redhead and blue head on my computer screen and, and that worked well. Um, I, and I sometimes have little pictures of, of um, thinkers or academics that represent something to me or perhaps mm-hmm. some words that is something I'm trying to work on and being better at. Um, so I think having that process, number one, that you can articulate, write it down. What is it you do? What are the steps you go through? Uh, that's in, invaluable uh, for all kinds of reasons, not just betting psychology. Um, the second thing is then just having those those triggers, those little tricks, which make you stick to that process. You know, make Around it recenter you, recent you, bring you back. Yeah, that's when you find yourself doing the thing that you know you shouldn't do. And we've all done it. You know, we've all sat there with a pizza on our lap. We've perhaps had a couple of beers and we're flicking through the TV. What we know we should have done is half an hour ago, we should have been in bed sleeping, but we just kind of start flicking through the channels. We come across sport and you kind of think, ah, you know, what's the harm? I'll just have a few dollars. And, it, and you know, um, perhaps that's fine, but I guess just don't kid yourself. You know, that's not the behaviour of someone who's making this pay. Um, you know, you, 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 you sweat blood to get some, some, uh, some profit in this game sometimes. And that can easily be, be flushed down the drain with, with a few evenings where you've, you've had a couple of beers and you find yourself betting on, on Taiwanese football. That was really great. Thanks so much for, for getting up so early and being able to punch us out.